per usual thing on shelves for educational purposes only and is not intended as financial advice. It is Macro Monday. Let's take a look at some non-Doomer macro data. First, we got to talk about Bitcoin, which broke the 52 and a half barrier here after, I guess, almost two weeks consolidating. Megaphone looks to be live. Potential upside targets look to be live. There is a bullish flag argument as well that I posted on Twitter. The Bitcoin ETFs had a massive day. I bit over a billion in notional volume. I think it closed the day at like 41 million shares. Just a monster today. And that's what we wanted to see. A break at 52 and a half, sort of no doubter through the yearly pivot. It certainly helps that the dollar is quiet and down. This is DXY, the dollar index. There was a risk here to reaccelerate on the bullish side. For whatever reason, despite the Fed likely cutting last amongst all global central banks, the likelihood that we in the U.S. enter a recession last if we do, I'd expect DXY to be stronger. So I don't really know what's going on there, but hey, we'll take it. Having's coming up. Post having, if we are below 100 on the DXY, that is to me easily a six-figure territory on BTC. It just signals extreme weakness in the U.S. dollar if we get below 100. Also today, NVIDIA quieting down. I mean, this this chart looks ugly, not in a bearish way. It's just so mangled, right? It's going to take probably a little bit of time to uh, heal whatever, whatever the heck this is up here, but it's still hanging out around 800. SMCI probably consolidates a little bit as well. Maybe the low time frames, you probably see some sort of M double top inverted Adam and Eve forming potentially. But as long as the hyper speculative go super fast stuff is slowing down you know that certainly helps the bitcoin side because like i said yesterday we sort of need that initial speculative push to really help get us over 52 and a half and i think that's what happened today along with massive institutional volume right so i'm sure we'll we'll hear some story about somebody onboarding or whatever else in the next couple of days here as far as flows are concerned from uh, James at CoinShares, last week was down from the prior three weeks, but hey, we'll take 500 million on a week. I'll take 250 million a day. Like, it doesn't matter. We know where this goes. We saw a little glimpse of the future today. And also, like I said yesterday, we don't need to be the fastest horse. We just need to be an option and people to just understand math and returns and the volatility and the institutional adoption will continue. iShares and Fidelity taking the lion's share of last week's volume. And in the flows data, I always like to look on the relative value basis, who's winning amongst the altcoins, just as we see on the Soul ETH chart, Soul ETH weakness playing out. You're seeing that in the flows. You're seeing flows out of Solana and into Ethereum. It's not a massive differential, but it's a nice little sentiment check, sentiment gauge sentiment indicator that validates the tech, right? The technicals. So far, so good on that front. And also, as far as flows are concerned, the gold folks not having a good time. They are seeing uh, pretty considerable outflows here from gold ETFs. And that differential against Bitcoin ETFs is pretty stark as they highlight here on Bloomberg. And, uh, you know, look, the more they talk about it, the more people are going to be wondering, why am I sitting in this gold thing? Like, yes, you know, Gold will maybe preserve value. If you look at the inflation-adjusted returns for gold, I don't think they've been that generous. If you look at the inflation-adjusted returns for Bitcoin, I don't think we're anywhere close to that all-time high. I think that would be around like 70K equivalent. But when you compare the charts, it's pretty obvious, right? If you can stomach the volatility, the winner is smacking you in the face. That's like the five-year return. Let's look at like the one-year return, okay? Pick whatever you want, one, three, five, ten. My guess is uh, Bitcoin's going to be the winner there. And if we look at gold just sort of sitting here, the chart looks bullish, but it is on a snail's pace time frame. So from a relative value perspective, opportunity cost perspective, to me, it makes extremely little sense to be sitting in gold here. It's not like we're going to get this recession surprise all of a sudden and you won't get this opportunity or rates are going to surprise get cut like it's just not going to happen. I, no, I don't see it happening. I'm not trying to talk people out of their gold position. I just don't know. The type of person sitting in gold 
probably doesn't care about Bitcoin anyway, but uh, it's just interesting to compare and contrast the two. Looking at the calendar this week, a bunch of Fed speak, a bunch of housing data. Really all I care about is uh, PCE and core PCE. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but that's uh, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. And again, what do these people do besides go on TV and talk? ISM, BMI, alphabet soup, consumer sentiment. Um, what, what else we got? Auto sales, you know, kind of a light week. I think that the week after that, is unemployment nfp so next friday that'll be more important we've got payroll data jerome powell in congress so this week's definitely a light week uh, fed beige book relative to this week's data prints in my eyes looking at trueflation we remain below two percent on the real-time gauge for inflation this is not using a lagging housing component this is using real-time data from uh, redfin zillow wherever else they get their data from if you're ever curious, you can always look at the components down here. And this is going to be different than what the Fed is looking at or using, but it has been a good gauge over the past couple of years now of the direction of inflation. And at this point, I don't really care what the Fed does because market's clearly humming. We're doing just fine. If uh, they want to keep rates elevated, go for it. I'm not really super concerned. Certain pockets of the economy, certain pockets of socioeconomic ladder are hurting significantly still. So Fed truly cares about those people, then they should keep rates higher for longer, which is what they're doing, which is what they've done. This is food at home versus food away from home since 2019. And things are still quite expensive away from home. I think everybody knows that, at least in my neck of the woods, I still see restaurants full. You know, I maybe have 20 restaurants on the main street here by me walking down Saturday night, all completely full. Passed by a Mexican place, overheard them say it was a two-hour wait. Okay, so I think in this this little microcosm bubble that I'm in, things are okay. So services, food away from home, definitely still under a lot of strain and pressure from demand. Looking at the Fed's estimate of February, they have CPI coming in at 3.11, which is above last month's print or I guess this month's print for last month. So I don't think the markets are going to be too happy with that. But if rates are the where they are where they are and everything's at all time highs, the question people keep asking is are we truly restrictive enough? Right? Do we get a surprise hike this year to account for what some people think is a re acceleration in inflation? Uh, if we look at PCE, core PCE that continues to come down and depending on three, six month, zero month annualized, whatever, this is also ticking up slightly. Okay. So it's funny that the doomers sort of highlight how high PCE is on the way down that we're not there yet. And then even when we're there for six months, that's not relevant. But the moment we slightly peak up above 2%, that's relevant, right? I'm not saying markets in Mayhem or Bloomberg are doomers here. It's just this is what I'm hearing, right? I'm hearing it's over. I'm hearing inflation's back. It's going to go back to 5 6%. We're never going to bring it down. Okay. I mean, we'll see, right? We'll see. I'm just not seeing it from the data just yet. Looking at Fed probabilities, essentially no probability of a hike in meeting a month from now. Again, we have unemployment data next week. That may affect the probabilities here. We may go to 100%. If unemployment remains at 3.7 or whatever or less, and remember the market was pricing in six cuts and it's gone from six cuts to four cuts. Now there's some whispers of, hey, they may just delay the cuts until after the election. So as though they don't appear political in nature. And if the economy is fine, sure. If jobs are fine, sure. Leave rates where they're at, right? Everybody's kind of happy. The bond people are happy. The, the, Yield people are happy because they're getting a yield. The stonk people are happy because stonks are at all-time highs. Eventually, we're going to bankrupt the United States. But, you know, that's a problem for the next generation. So what do they care? They're going to keep issuing debt. And that debt is going to be at a higher and higher percentage to refinance. It just is what it is. But in the moment, the sun is shining and things feel great. Looking at the yield curve, we are re-inverting steeper, steeply, 
I don't know if, it, if this is a bear steepener or not at this point, but so far so good. All these people talking about recession, all the numbers look bad, jobs, jobs, jobs. Okay, look, when, when we uninvert, that's the time for me internally to say, okay, let's go a little risk off here. Let's account for the historic importance of the yield curve relative to employment. We are not there yet. We're just not there yet. So we can look at all the data. You can look at the credit card numbers. You can look at all this stuff that you get every week, every month. It just hasn't mattered yet. Not saying it won't matter down the line. Hasn't mattered yet. I don't think you're going to wake up someday and there's going to be some massive surprise here. So until then, the party continues. And it's kind of stuff like this, not to call out Kurt here specifically, but like, look, I'm not going to disagree with historical data. He's basically saying if the Fed cuts with an inverted yield curve, a recession is coming. Okay. They haven't cut yet. The yield curve is still inverted. Not only haven't they cut, but now they're talking about not cutting till December or whatever it is. <laughs> like, like we have, there's, there's time here, right? So yes, we can get very bearish on everything. We can say it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And in the meantime, we move another 10, 15, 20%, and everybody's sort of waiting for the ball to drop. So again, we're not quite there yet. Looking at yields and the yield curve, we're still heavily inverted here, okay? If we look at the yield curve itself, the long end, the belly is sort of rising, more of the belly than the long end. The long end's kind of stuck in the mud back here. And the front end is up as well. So I'm a novice on the macro side, but to me, things look okay in the moment. Looking at reverse repo, still around 500 billion. We talk about this every week, but it's the uh, slush fund that we're using to pay for short-term debt. This is money from money market accounts that are, that's being parked with the Fed for an overnight rate. And they can now get those rates with short-term U.S. Treasuries, and that's why we're seeing this get drained from over two trillion to under six hundred billion. This has kind of flattened out a little bit. So the question is, are we just going to chill at five hundred billion here? I think over time this is going to continue to get chunked away. But that's something else that I don't think many people are accounting for. They're sort of waiting for this to go to completely to zero. What if we don't? Then what? Three to five hundred is what Bianco thinks this will go to. So we may be already in more trouble than we realize if we're waiting in reverse repo to go completely to zero. And we'll see with uh, the short-term debt that's getting issued if yields continue to creep up. GDP looks okay. This is not recessionary GDP. And I know people who are recessionistas don't believe these numbers anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But uh, we're still well above 2%, closer to 3%. No issues on that front. Talking about the lower end of the Consumer spectrum again here, apparently refunds are down considerably. So this is going to continue to squeeze those people who are paying 22% or whatever for their credit card. The people who aren't getting yield on cash, the people who are paying those interest rates, they're going to continue to get squeezed. Not only that, gas prices slightly ticking up. This is as of last week. I think they're up a little bit more than this, maybe even today. So I don't think there's too much to get alarmed with here, but if you're driving every day, you're not seeing relief in the gas price, not as much on a relative basis as you were throughout 2023. If we look at the oil chart, we do see some strength here coming off of a relative low, whether or not this is the US government bidding oil to refill the strategic petroleum reserve, or we just hit a natural level there because of restrictive oil supply from OPEC, we have bounced a little bit. Again, I hear and see bears talking about, you know, energy resurging to 90 plus. I don't see that in the chart. I'm not saying it's impossible, but this does not look like a chart that is ready to just go back to 91. This very much looks like to me just to be a range in the moment, right? If we're above 85, then we can start to signal the alarm bells. But as we sit here, not too much is happening. If we look at XLE, which is the energy ETF. This thing has sort of come back from the dead, still holding the ascending triangle. So maybe something to watch for later into the year, give it a few more weeks, maybe into Q3. And the likelihood of elevated, elevated inflation if XLE breaks 93, okay, I think is high. So I think there is a correlation there and just something to consider, but we're not there yet. We're just not there yet. 
right? Oil is up, but not significantly. XLE still looks bullish, which is bearish for the economy, but bullish for energy. Look at the S&P. Not much has changed week over week here. We're still sort of sitting at 5,100. We're at that magic yearly pivot level. We have a rising wedge. We have a bear div. All of this isn't exactly conducive to breaking a yearly pivot on the first try. I mean, look at Bitcoin, right? It took a week or two slamming on that resistance to finally break. So is this outright bearish? Probably, right? It's a rising wedge. It's, it's a bear div. That's bearish. It's not quite to the cup and handle. Do I think this is going to go back to 4,000? No, I don't. Okay. But is it possible that the S&P sees a pullback below 5,000? Sure. Generally, though, the trend here is still very much bullish. It just doesn't have a lot of momentum up here at the moment. The Q's very similar, just sort of meandering. Maybe this is a rising wedge up here. Not quite to the pattern target. Doesn't need to get there in a day. You know, this could take months to get to that target. Definitely has a bear div there. So on the crypto side, I think this helps us more than it hurts us as long as we don't see some massive collapse in the indices. We see a little bit of money rotating around. Maybe some of that NVIDIA money rotates into IBIT, for example. Maybe some of the tech money rotates around. And you have this wealth effect rotating into BTC a little bit, potentially. But so far, so good on the multi-month pattern there. Even the IWM, which is the low-cap 2000 companies, mostly financials, looks okay. This does not look bearish, right? You're at the top of the range. Low time frame, W, cup and handle, looks fine. I don't think this is tradable in a sense that from a relative value perspective, you're probably better off almost anywhere else. But if we're talking about breadth and we're talking about you know equal weighted S&P, okay, even this thing broke out. And this is a rising channel. So yes, NVIDIA and SMCI, call it a bubble, call it whatever you want. I don't really care. Collectively, things are doing quite well, even for the lower caps. So what is there to be bearish about? here. I just, I don't see it. Are we bearish on corporate debt? Are we bearish on wages? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It looks okay to me here. Uh, SMH is another one. I'm in an active trade here, so I'm definitely watching this closer as this gets to its target. This is the semiconductor ETF. There's always a question of where do you close trades like this? You know, if you, if you bought the breakout, you can always close it at the 1618. You can put a trailing stop loss all the way back to the 1618 once it breaches the 1618. That way you give it a little bit of a room to run. You can start to shave it off, you know, day by day, 10%, 10%. Lots of ways you could play this. Uh, or you could just leave it all on and say, okay, 237 is the top end. That's where it could go. I'm in that camp personally, as long as SMCI and NVIDIA are okay. You know, there's, there's other things that can run. TSM, whatever else is in this thing. But it definitely looks overextended, right? I mean, it's just been straight up since since the breakout. So it would make sense that it takes a pause all the way up there. And then for, as far as individual names, this is one I talked about a couple weeks back. I didn't actually trade this. I just didn't have a way to allocate into this easily based on what I'm currently trading on the legacy side. But talk about a company that has almost no reason to exist, Carvana. Massive inverted head and shoulders. You get an inverted head and shoulders on the right shoulder of the massive inverted head and shoulders. I don't know if this goes to 100 or not, but it did break out. So something to maybe watch on the periphery just for entertainment value, if nothing else. McDonald's, stealing this from Trendspider, great follow, by the way. Definitely give him a follow. Also printing in inverted head and shoulders. So yeah, a lot of companies maybe not doing so hot. Maybe they need to figure it out or die. Okay, capitalism. Um, but there are many options here to play. You don't have to just get stuck in IWM. You, know, you can look around. As far as some crypto stuff, ETH E doing quite well as that discount slowly continues to close with the expectation of ETH ETFs in the near term, sometime in May potentially. ETH Spot outright doing quite well, also helping push this up. If I was conservative on looking to close this position, it would probably be somewhere around 28 based on previous support resist levels. Based on the time to May, and where this could continue to run, I don't think there's any rush. So depending on which camp you're in there, it's a good problem to have. I think this could keep going a little bit into May, so long as ETH spot remains relatively strong, which it has. So I have no issues uh, with the ETH chart. If we want to talk about almost like YOLO gamble type stuff, 
I've brought this up a few times, but ETCG is a grayscale Ethereum Classic Trust. Speaking of things that shouldn't exist, but uh, this does exist, but Barry DCG own most of this trust. Whether or not this is going to get converted, I don't know. I don't really care. I doubt it. Okay. But it does have a significant discount <laughs> to spot. So if you're looking to play the next thing, this is an option. I didn't check the GDLC discount or the other BitW, I think it is, right? The discounts there. Those probably still have discounts as well. But if you're looking for the next, like, you know, discount trade, this could be one of them. High time frames look good for ETC, in my opinion. Low time frames for ETCG. I choose to see bullishness here because everything's bullish. So to me, this leans like an inverted head and shoulders, which admittedly doesn't make too much sense at the top of a trend generally that's a bullish reversal okay so you could argue diamond top here you can sort of see it you can draw it out in your head so one way to play this right would be let's set an alert at what looks to be a horizontal somewhere at 13 let's set an alert at 1150 you could start accumulating this here with a stop loss at 1150 you could start accumulating this here and then add to the position significantly if it gets above 13 you could be watching uh, discount, seeing if that's closing or not. It's just something to consider. Just an interesting little setup here because the, the discount is so massive, right? That's why I think it's, it's attractive, even though it's a very silly product and instrument. From a technical perspective, I think there's an argument for a breakout here above 13. So we'll see. But that's an interesting one to watch. Marathon completing what looks to be an inverted head and shoulders into earnings this week on the 28th. This measures to 40-ish. We'll see if that happens or not. Riot earnings were a disaster. Hut earnings were a dumpster fire. I don't expect Mara earnings to be that bad, but what do I know? Uh, technicals look pretty good on that. CleanSpark also just continues to be the clear leader in what the market thinks is the shining beacon on a hill of a mining company, okay? They're doing phenomenal. At this point, this is uh, reaching parabolic advance territory. You can draw a pitchfork here, but it's even out of the pitchfork. So long-term, long-trend, if you're convicted in certain miners, that makes sense as a business. I think you'll do fine. Coinbase is another one I talked about yesterday. Cup and handle up here, like a legitimate cup and handle. This probably goes higher. I think this easily goes to 200 plus, especially if everything else remains bullish. So if anything, you know, I am relieved to continue to hear people sitting on the sidelines, bearish. The same five people calling for a recession that have called the last two recessions despite screaming about recession every month, okay? These people are still out there. They haven't capitulated. So we party on. I'll be wrong one day, but that day ain't coming anytime soon. That's all I have for this one. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, and happy trading.